Okay, according to me, you should be seeing a full screen. If not, scream. Um, I should just alert you to the fact that I was going to free ride on Agostino's literature review. So um, um, I'll just do that a little bit on the fly. So this is joint work with uh, Alfred Lehar, and I think it goes without saying that Alfred is doing all the heavy lifting, and I'm just around for sort of the marketing component. Um, so, um, as I said, I was going to free ride off Agostino's literature review, and my discussant, Andreas Park, has a paper on this topic on automated market makers and whether or not they make sense, decentralized exchanges. My PhD student, um, uh, Juna Yogi, um, has also has a paper on the differences between DEX and decentralized exchanges and centralized. Um, and of course, Agostino also has a paper. So there's, there is literature and hopefully you'll get to see that in the next um, presentation. So I just wanted to jump right in and to say what we're trying to do. So automated market makers are different because they're on a blockchain and all these sorts of other things. But in addition, they're a completely different model of liquidity provision. And what is different about automated market makers as opposed to centralized limit order books that we're all used to is uh, with automated market makers, both the costs, sort of in the economic costs, so adverse selection, and benefits in terms of the liquidity rebates or fees um, are mutualized. So they're shared pro rata. So this is like pro rata rationing in exchanges, which we typically don't see unless we're thinking about inter-exchange inter competition, the way say Albert and uh, Thierry did when they were looking at the introduction um, of limit order, competing limit order books in, uh, in the EU. The other thing that's different about, you can nod Alfred, uh, Albert, sorry. Um, the other thing that's different um, about automated market makers is the price impact is mechanical. In limit order books, uh, basically what happens is these li liquidity suppliers choose a price. They choose a price and a quantity. So they're implicitly choosing the price impact that's faced by anyone who enters the market. In the automated market maker, price impact is mechanical. It is a function, uh, a, a, a function that is widely available and observable of uh, the pool size. So everyone sort of knows what the price impact is conditional on coming in to trade at any point in time. The way the market equilibrates is not by people withdrawing their orders or choosing price impact. It equi equilibrates by basically people deciding to enter or leave the pool. So the quantity supply, the liquidity supply basically is the way the sort of market comes to equilibrium. And so given these differences, the questions that we wanted to ask is, you know, does it work? Uh, if so, how well, how do we want to think about it? Um, so uh, just as sort of a side note, I'd like to remind people of sort of limit order books. So pretty much Larry Gloston put his foot down with the inevitability of the limit order book and sort of, sort of came to, made the argument that the limit order book is sort of the best way of providing low cost liquidity. And so this was gonna take over the world. And institutionally it really has, right? Every, pretty much everyone does buy an electronic limit order book. Um, Larry also had a follow-up paper, which was, I don't think ever published, which is on rationing rules. So what is the effect of changes in rationing rules? So instead of being first in, first out, but something else, how does that affect liquidity provision? And there's, as far as we could tell, there's been one empirical paper that looked at changes in uh, rationing rules. And this was some funky uh, problem in the treasury futures markets um, that are done on a centralized limit order book. And for some technical reason, they had to switch for a period to pro rata rationing. And there's this paper uh, where they find that basically this resulted in slightly lower price efficiency, doing a sort of difference in difference. So there's been little theory work and little empirical work. So this is sort of where we fit. So what, how are we thinking about the world? This is the most simple standard uh, limit order or trading thing that you could think about. 
Um, there's a market order submitter who basically is just demanding liquidity and they trade a fixed amount Q. They're trading in an asset and the asset can either go up or go down. And the amount that it goes up or goes down is sigma. So basically there's this potential for adverse selection. In addition, there's this liquidity demand for trade. The people who are playing in the market are gonna be an arbitrageur, uh, liquidity suppliers, and everyone is risk neutral and strategic, except for the liquidity demander. So the difference between the two markets is essentially how liquidity is supplied and consumed. In the limit order market, the, basically the liquidity suppliers uh, trade off adverse selection against profitable uh, liquidity provision. If they have two extreme, if they have a very extreme price, that's great. They manage to extract a lot of rents from the liquidity demander, but they're more likely to be hit in the case of a mispriced asset, right? Um, and they compete by choosing price impact. They also have, because they're competing, and basically the competes the the competition erodes their rents. They also have an incentive to compete in a way that doesn't benefit the liquidity demander. They have an incentive to compete, uh, essentially to make themselves monopolist. And with this idea, we're trying to capture, you know, uh, HFT investment in co-location, all those things that we think liquidity suppliers are doing in modern markets, but basically aren't nice. Um, what, what about the automated market maker or the constant product market maker? Um, well, the profits are mutualized. They don't compete. The whole structure is they don't compete. And in addition, we have this deterministic uh, price impact as a function of pool size. The pool adjusts. So what does the model look like? Well, in the limit order market, the sequence of events is straightforward. So first of all, the liquidity suppliers, if they're gonna compete on a non-liquidity uh, uh, dimension, so we call this a monitoring technology, they can do that, right? Then nature basically takes their investments and maps it into um, a degree of market power in a particular market. They post their optimal limit orders given the fact that uh, they, know, they know whether or not they're competing or not. Nature then draws an innovation and basically you then you get a liquidity trader or an arbitrageur. So pretty much a straightforward model of liquidity provision. The automated market maker by contrast is, uh, the structure is a little bit different, reflecting the fact that the, the rules are different. So first the liquidity suppliers commit capital to a pool. So this is, they decide this is the pool they wanna join given the characteristics of the pool. Then we have either an asset innovation if there is an asset innovation, then the price implied by the, uh, the two assets that are sitting in the pool is off from whatever the fundamental value is, and the arbitrageur trades. So this is basically the arbitrageur picking off mispriced liquidity. If there's no innovation, then the liquidity trader comes, and then the price again is because a price impact is distorted away from what we think the fundamental value is, the arbitrageur, if there's a profitable trading opportunity, will then come in and trade, right? So one thing to notice about this sort of schematic of these two different uh, ways in which the market operates is if you think about the total rents that we have available, which is how much the liquidity supply or the liquidity demander is willing to pay in order to get his orders executed, right? Essentially those rents are split in a different way in the limit order market and the automated market maker. In particular, in the automated market maker, uh, the arbitrageur, because he works to equilibrate the prices, if there was a non-informed trade, basically takes some of those rents. So this is just something to keep in mind. It's gonna be one of the differences. So what do we do when we have this framework? We characterize uh, you know, what equilibrium looks like in the limit order market. And as you'd expect, if two limit order suppliers are competing at the same time, they're basically going to get zero profits. It's sort of Bertrand, but a little bit more complicated. If they're alone in the market, well, they can extract monopoly rents from the uninformed trader. And they also, of course, because of these monopoly rents, have an incentive to invest to become uh, a monopolist. In the automated market maker, 
uh, basically people are just deciding which pool to enter into, not based on sort of high frequency movements in anything, but on the average characteristics that they expect. Uh, they basically just join a pool until the marginal benefit of joining a pool is equal to the marginal cost, essentially sort of a zero profit condition. And this determines a pool size. And these pool sizes are stable because they're done on the sort of average population characteristics. Okay, so we have this stuff and we can sort of do sort of little comparative statics. And the question is, well, what does life look like? And that's where the data comes in. So in terms of the data, what we... Just a, uh, uh, information question. Uh, so I'm, this is super interesting, but I'm, I'm not so familiar at all with this market. So when, you, when you, as an automated market maker, consider being part of the pool, do you see who is already in there? So can you condition your participation on others there, or is it, is it going to be dark? You can condition participation on the size of the pool. Um, and with a little bit of work, you might be able to identify the wallets where some of the uh, the liquidity tokens, are, where the liquidity tokens are going, but you don't know the participants, you know the number of participants. Yeah. Okay, so we have, when I say we, Alfred basically, um, gets, uh, has data on uh, V1 and uh, V2 liquidity pools. So V1 was sort of the first thing that came out and it was sort of interesting, but didn't really work that well. V2 is sort of the thing that took off when everyone talks about uh, DeFi and um, how successful it's being. They're pretty much, and Uniswap in particular, they're particularly talking about the V2 liquidity pools, right? And there's quite a bit of this stuff so we have, you know, about 40,000 liquidity pools um, um, and uh, we have transactions. You can map transactions on uh, the Ethereum blockchain. We got some data from a, a Vancouver company that does this. And um, basically we see a couple of things. We see people entering into um, the liquidity pool. So these are liquidity injections. We see people taking stuff out of the liquidity pools, so withdrawals, and then we also see trades. So trades are just people who are using the liquidity and moving on with their lives. Um, there's a whole bunch of very complex transactions and flash swaps. One of the things that makes it sort of difficult to come up with uh, sensible numbers, or you have to sort of make choices, is because, because transactions on the blockchain are um, atomic, you essentially have these flash things. So you have like super complex things that happen within one transaction or within one block. Um, and the question is, you know, do you want to think about somebody who, you know, buys a million dollars and then re replaces it within one block? Do you want to think of that as uh, one transaction, two transactions? What is that? Right. So in some cases, we just sort of aggregate and we look at um, day long things and we have sort of specific algorithms where we sort of deal with these more complex uh, data data issues. OK, so just to give you a sense of what the pools look like. So uh, the top the top panel are V2 pools and the bottom panel are V1 pools. Um, so. Um, Pretty much because Uniswap started as um, on the Ethereum blockchain, um, it's the numerator good is pretty much Ethereum. And so in particular, it's wrapped Ethereum because Ethereum itself doesn't uh, execute on the, uh, the Ethereum blockchain. It has to be wrapped. So it's an ERC-20 compliant token. So it's a token. So it's, it's just like a little weird technical thing. So um, wrapped Ether against Tether. Uh, basically, this in our data, sort of this gives you the sense of the number of transactions we see, uh, the volume, and the volume broken down by either e Ethereum or US dollars. US dollars are converted uh, using uh, high frequency uh, Binance trades and sort of the pool size. And th these pool sizes are pretty big. Um, so, um, you know, there's, there's a lot of money that's sitting here. Right? Okay. This is sort of a picture that gives you a sense of um, uh, trading volume. So this is converted into US dollars. This is on the y-axis and this is on a day, so UTC. Um, and the different colors basically are, the blue is Uniswap V1. 
So I said this was the first one. It didn't really take off. So it's just kind of there. Uh, once things are on a blockchain, they just never disappear. So they're always there. The orange is basically the V2 trades. And these, once again, are direct to wrap ETH. And there's a little stuff to other tokens, but most of the stuff is denominated in Ether and goes to trade in ETH. To give you another sense of what the data look like or what these actual pools look like, as you can see, this wrapped ETH is the center of pretty much everything. Everyone wants to trap to trade against this wrapped ETH. And just to notice um, these, the thicker lines is basically related to um, the volume. So these are stable coins. So this is Tether and this is USDC, the stable coin by the Circle Group. Um, and this, of course, is DAI, which is the maker token. Um, and so uh, this just gives you a sense that everything is sort of being denominated in wrapped ETH. Okay. So how do we want to look at this data? How do we want to think about it? Well, uh, the model of liquidity provision that we have essentially has some, some uh, predictions. So let's see what they look like. And basically, we're sort of characterizing equilibrium in terms of this, the size of the liquidity pool. And the liquidity pool size in our formulation um, is linear in the size of the liquidity trade. So basically, more the, the larger the size of liquidity trade, the larger the pool. Um, it's decreasing in the size of innovation. The more likely you are to have the asset jumping around um, or jumping around or jumping a large amount basically means that you're more likely if you're supplying passive liquidity to be picked off. Um, which obviously you don't like. So uh, what happens? The equilibrium process is that people don't put as many tokens in. If they don't put any tokens in, mechanically, the price impact is bigger, right? So this is sort of just how the market equilibrates. And also it's decreasing the probability of informed trade. So that's sort of a similar, uh, a similar logic. It's just sort of to get around the adverse selection problem. And so we look at this by regressing pool size on price volatility and also on measures of um, uninformed trading. And it turns out um, that, um, sorry, I'm just checking my time and I, I think I'm going really too slowly. Okay, so it turns out that the sorts of things that we think should affect the pool size do affect the pool size. Right. So basically, the more volatility the underlying token is that's being traded, basically, the uh, smaller the pool size. Right. The larger the, the size of the trade, the bigger the pool size. Um, and so all the sorts of things that we think should be affecting the pool size do seem to work. OK. So, um, OK. So that says that there's some the, the model sort of makes sense or the, the frictions are sort of there. Um, how do we want to think about whether or not this automated market maker is success providing uh, liquidity, right? Well, one of the things that we can sort of look at is essentially the stability of the liquidity supply. When we think about limit order markets, what we're worried about, or in particular, what's sort of been a very big topic of, of conversation is this idea of flash crashes, which is liquidity supply is concentrated in strategic traders. And what, they're, what they do if they think that there's going to be an adverse event is they withdraw liquidity, which essentially leads to a massive price impact or a flash crash. So this is different in the automated market maker pool. You basically put the liquidity in and it takes time to take it out. And it's you, the reason why you put it in this automated market maker is you don't want to take it out. So we do a sort of a little analysis where we look at liquidity withdrawals from pools. Um, so on the pool level, we also look at on the wallet level, the people that we know have injected liquidity, how frequently they take it out and so forth. And basically the bottom line is that people put stuff in these liquidity pools and then just walk away, right? So the liquidity supply is stable. And just to give you a flavor of that, let me tell you about one very specific situation where Ethereum dropped by a massive 41%. To give you a sense of how big 41% is, the, 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 um, the crash, the October crash was 20 
20%, right? So this is double, absolutely massive. Even though there was this huge, huge change in the price of Ethereum, which would have affected um, essentially the, the terms of trade in each of the pools, there was a very small, relatively small uh, withdra- withdrawal of liquidity. And this, this picture gives you some sense of it. So this is just, we're just picking, I'm just picking this out of a particular day. So this is that day where you see this absolutely um, massive uh, drop in the price of Ethereum, okay? So what happened to the liquidity supply? There was a little bit of contemporaneous withdrawal. Other liquidity was withdrawn over the next essentially hour, okay? Uh, Partially because it takes time to sort of do your transactions on a blockchain, but also because um, you know people people put their liquidity in and they just sort of uh, sat there, right? Okay, so let me just sort of zip through. Um, I'm really getting over time here, um, so let me just sort of zip through uh, what else we did. We compared this. Um, if you can hear that dog, it's the postman. Um, we compared. Um, uh, what happens on the automated market maker to a centralized exchange. And so the centralized exchange we used is Binance, not Binance US, which is kind of small and insignificant, but Binance Binance, which I guess is now registered in Malta. Um, and we looked at uh, minute interval data just to match it to the blockchain. And we found tokens that basically trade on both. Okay. And so uh, we took away the small trading volume and basically we have some pairs that are cross-listed um, with uh, quite a few tokens, right? And what's kind of interesting is the prices are really, 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 really in lockstep. So this is consistent with arbitrageurs making sure that the prices in cryptocurrencies are basically the, the right, right across all the different trading venues. So this, this is, um, uh, this, the, the, the mass is basically uh, pool size, right? And basically this blue line is pricing error, okay? So essentially if the pool size hits a certain size, right? uh, The pricing error basically goes to zero, right? Um, What about price impact? This is something that we'll worry about for liquidity traders. Um, Well, this shows you uh, matching uh, up again, uh, prices on Uniswap, which are orange and green, which are these tiny, 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 tiny little lines along the bottom. And basically the price impacts on uh, Binance, which are these massive, massive spikes, okay? And these are on the same scale. Um, And basically what you see is you see much, much uh, higher price impacts on Binance. And this is sort of the idea that liquidity is much more agile in a centralized limit order book because all the liquidity suppliers are essentially internalizing um, the fact that, you know, if their order gets executed and it's on them, it's not mutualized, right? This sort of is consistent with the trading volume. Um, this shows one particular day um, and the prices track really, really, really closely. Um, yeah, okay, so let me just conclude then. Um, so this is still work in progress. So love to have everyone's comments and sort of think about things that we should look at. We're still sort of sorting through to understand it all. Um, and what we're kind of interested in is to say, okay, how does this new model of liquidity provision work? And does it make sense? And there's, there seem to be parameters under which this automated market maker or constant product market maker um, more specifically uh, dominates. Um, and of course, when we look at the data, the ones where the automated market maker is going to be relatively more efficient are the ones that we see, of course, because people are rational. Um, the other thing about automated market making that's sort of interesting is this sort of stability characteristic of it. Um, it's really not prone to runs, which is sort of one of the things that we worry about in centralized limit order books. And I think uh, just as sort of um, a uh, final there, this sort of new model of liquidity provision is being taken up uh, institutionally. So uh, BaFin, I guess the German regulator, 
has basically uh, given regulatory approval to a Uniswap clone, a swarm, to trade uh, in Germany. So, um, and also there's sort of uh, various other sort of institutional experiments, um, not, not only Binance and their pancake swap, but basically other people are trying to see if they can integrate these automated market makers into more traditional markets. Thank you very much. Okay, so let me restart. So this paper, so thank me, thanks again for letting me discuss this paper. Um, I've seen several iterations of it and it gets better every time I see it. Um, now, the bigger context that I want to talk about is that of decentralized finance, because this is where this uh, paper fits in and decentralized exchanges are really just a core component of it. And so there are right ways and wrong ways to think of blockchain technology and to think of this whole crypto space. The wrong way is to think about it just as a new set of assets that people trade, it's a vehicle for money laundering and so on and so forth. I think that's very narrow-minded and it kind of misses the big picture because at its core, what a blockchain is, is a, a common resource that can be used by anybody who wants to make a contribution and who wants to use this to provide a service. It provides guaranteed execution of code and this is really what blockchains do. Now, a decentralized exchange um, is, if you want, is, is probably the first really clever application in this area of decentralized finance. And let me explain this why. Now, when you think of doing an exchange, um, doing trading on a blockchain in a decentralized manner, there's many ways how you can think of doing it. The first iteration of that is something called Ether Delta. And so what that really was is they took uh, a limit order, which is you can just express as a piece of code and put it on the blockchain. They found a mask so that you can find these registered orders um, on, on the blockchain. And then they had a mechanism that would allow people to trade against these limit orders when they're found on the blockchain. Now, this is for those of us, we all, have, we all in microstructure, we know how much uh, usually happens in limit order books with order cancellation and so on and so forth. And so that is an extremely inefficient way how to organize and use a blockchain. Why? Because you have to pay for every order submission. And then not only do does the miner who puts this on the blockchain has to process the code, actually effectively every single node in the network has to do this. And we're talking about 10,000s of nodes. So this is a very, very bad way to use the blockchain and Ether Delta never really took off. But what Uniswap was at its core is that they used this idea of a blockchain as a common resource and, and used it in a manner so that it actually really works in, in a very clever way. So the idea there is, is they basically build a smart contract. Um, they call it a liquidity pool, but it's in some sense, it's like, a, it's like a conditional code execution that people can de make deposits into. In the case of Uniswap, it's always in pairs. Um, there's other systems like Balancer where you can have an entire portfolio that you can deposit in a contract. And then somebody wants to trade with this contract or wants to do a trade, they send money to this contract in some form of the tokens that are deposited and they receive something in return. And that's really all that it is. And then the contract just makes an execution of, uh, of, of, that, of that matter as an atomic swap on the blockchain. Now, I have a, a lot of slides here on general things about uh, decentralized finance. Let me just say a few things. So clearly, a lot of people don't understand what it's about. Here we have uh, one example that the Americans will be very familiar with. Um, what did she say? So DeFi refers to a fast-growing and highly opaque corner of the cryptocurrency markets that allows people to engage, God forbid, without intermediaries like a bank. This clearly has to be, uh, you know, put, it has to be made illegal. How dare they? Um, Obviously, you know, there's a complete misunderstanding of it. Calling this highly opaque is nonsense because all the codes that are executing are, you know, visible. Everybody can see what's going on. Now, it's not means that everybody understands it, but it's clearly visible. It's auditable. Um, and, you know, it's traceable because, you know, if you want to make a trade on this Ethereum blockchain, you, you will be able to see that somebody has done the trade and you can trace this all the way to the point when somebody wants to take the money and use it. So this whole business of money laundering, is, is, you know, it, yeah, may it happen, but, you know, probably a lot more happens in the, in the current financial system and will always happen in the financial system and in the DeFi world. Anyway, so there's a big call now, and it was recently in, in the Senate in the US to just put more regulation on it because, God forbid, people do something without, you know, regulation. Now, it's a very growing in ecosystem. You can see how over the last year alone, this basically the, the amount of money that is used in DeFi applications has exploded. And, uh, you know, the, if you look at just how much money is stored on some of these contracts, like Uniswap is on the order of billions of dollars worth. 
Um, it's also, uh, in terms of the trading volume that is processed by it, it's, it's quite significant. Here, this is a graph. It doesn't look as significant as it seems, but um, so it shows Binance. As uh, Christine said, this is the, you know, the, the biggest exchange in the world. It uh, processes about uh, 10 times as much as Coinbase, which is the second largest, um, and Uniswap. And if you take all the DEX uh, decentralized exchanges together, they actually process more transactions these days, so more volume than, uh, than Coinbase. So this is a very significant part of the, if you want to look into the trading of crypto assets. Um, you know, here's another graph for that. Now there's also an entire ecosystem of services that develops around this. For instance, there's aggregators that seek the best. If you want, this is like a smart order router version of, uh, of these decentralized exchanges. And there's some real money being earned. So this gives you an idea of the, the fees that are, put, that, are, that are generated by using uh, these uh, different pieces of uh, these different applications. So this is like people who supply liquidity earn collectively the amount of money that you see over there on a daily basis. So we're talking about millions of dollars. Now, the question is, when we go back to decentralized chain trading, um, there's, a, there's a critical question here is, so, you know, you have a contract, the contract makes a trade. The really big question that we have as economists is, well, what's the price, right? So how do you set that price? There's effectively two ways that you can think about it. Uh, one would be to um, do an Oracle, which means you get the price from somewhere else. And the other one is you do a hard coded function. So that takes the information um, of, for instance, the con components of uh, the, the smart contract at the time and then finds the right price. Sometimes it's also referred to as a bonding curve because it sort of bonds the different items together that are in the blockchain and finds the right uh, price for it. So. The bonding curve uh, in particular that uh, Christine looks at and that actually at the moment all of the uh, swap exchanges use is something called the constant product pricing function or constant product market making function. And it basically means that there's two tokens, there's a token A and a token B, there's a certain balance of the token, which is the liquidity deposited in these contracts, uh, call them X and Y. Um, and uh, what the pricing mechanism basically says is that you price along, if you want, an ISO liquidity curve. So it means that the product of the token amounts in the contract has to be constant uh, from before to after a trade. Um, you know, then th there's lots of, you know, it's very straightforward to compute. It's very, very, very straightforward to use in the contract. But um, let me just say there are some problems with this. Um, so from an economics perspective, the first thing that we all dislike about this is, is an ad hoc rule, right? So there's no demand and supply in general that, that gives rise to this particular, uh, well, rather there's an open question of whether or not there's actually any demand and supply that gives rise to this particular pricing rule. So is, there's a question then if this is a fair compensation for the risk that the liquidity for riders have. Um, we can wave our hands normally when we think of markets as a whole, because we say, well, you know, on demand supply equilibrate and there's a price coming from it, but here's a hard coded function. So this is very different. Um, so what this paper does is it provides some clarity on this and it's really like this, right? So they basically say, under what conditions will liquidity providers be willing to provide liquidity to participate in this particular pricing scheme? And then they do make a, cons a comparison with the same type of people and the same type of uh, scenario on what would happen in a limit order market? If you could do the whole trade, if the liquidity providers provide liquidity in the market and people can access that market. I think this is great. And then they provide also some stylized facts on this willingness and try to match their model with the data. So I think this is a really great piece of work and, and it really contributes to our understanding and also to my understanding. I want to briefly say, however, that this function is, I, I have, I mean, I've written some work on this and <clears throat> it's actually intrinsically problematic because actually it provides persistent arbitrage opportunities. That's something that's been um, identified. And uh, so it's, it follows loosely under, under, the, um, under the big umbrella of what's called minor extractable value. So it basically means that money that can be extracted simply by mispriced transactions or poorly priced transactions on the Ethereum blockchain. And we're talking about almost a billion dollars worth has been uh, lost that way if you want to invest in. All right, let me now talk about the specifics of the paper. I'm going to focus a little bit more on the theoretical side because that's kind of my, my wheelhouse. Um, so uh, there's an asset that may change in value, may go up or down or may not change. Um, there's liquidity providers. Um, as Christine has it, there's two. For, you know, very loosely, as Christine said, there's a sort of Betron competition going on. And you know, in order to have competitive prices, you really need only two with Betron. Um, there's a liquidity trader who trades a fixed quantity um, for reasons outside of the model. And there's an arbitrageur that takes advantage in the limit order book of value changes. 
and in the constant product market, constant product model of um, of both the value changes and also of the mispricing or price dislocations that would have been caused by the liquidity traders. So now in the limit order book, um, it's the it's a very simple model. It's a very standard model in the sense there's um, you know there's a discriminatory pricing schedule that the true liquidity providers post. Um, they benefit from the liquidity traders. They lose against the arbitrageur. And you know, very loosely speaking, as Christine said, there is some form of uh, zero profit condition that gives rise to the particular pricing formulation of the limit order book. This is all work that we know. Then when we look at the constant product model, there's a question of, okay, so the pricing rule is fixed. That's not a choice. Um, so you have to ask yourself what will happen. So first, when the liquidity trade occurs, um, that will get reversed. So in many ways, you can think of that the liquidity providers don't benefit or lose from that particular trade. So it gets re so it gets traded by the liquidity trader, and then it gets reversed by the arbitrageur. But they do gain the fee that is involved there. Now, there's an informed trade. You basically get picked off if you want. <clears throat> so now, if this information event happens, what the arbitrageur will do is they will pick the quantity to maximize the profits. Um, so that's the first maximization problem that you have. Now, what the liquidity provider has to do then has to think of, okay, considering con conditional on what the different traders will do in terms of the amount that they will trade, how much will I lose against the arbitrageur and how much will I earn in fees from the other direction of the trades? And so now, as I understand it, um, and so this is a little subtle, and as Christine said, there's no competition among the liquidity providers there. Um, in some sense, there is, there is competition. So if I would be the only one, I could maximize the amount of liquidity that I would provide. So I potentially could have positive profits. But I think the, the way the, the proof in the paper works is that you actually keep adding liquidity up to the point where you just be breaking even. But Christine can correct me on that one. So there is no competition, but there is kind of some, there's a, there's a certain way of how they compete because they're trying to extract as much revenue as they can from the fees. So um, now, um, the comparison that they do in the paper then goes as follows. You uh, compare basically uh, the liquidity providers. In both cases, I understand it earns zero profit. So really the question is the arbitrageurs gain at the expense of the liquidity trader. So really the question is how much does a liquidity trader have to pay for that particular fixed quantity that they want to trade? And, and that basically gives rise then to the theoretical results that allows us to make the comparison. The paper has a closed form expression for that, which is great they can't quite get a, uh, a definitive result on, on, you know, one is always better than the other, but there's some indicative statements, usually against the monitoring costs that are um, at, at some other point in the paper, which I haven't really discussed yet. So um, here's some questions that I have um, since I do a discussion. So just as some suggestions. Um, so um, first day is I, I'll, I'll be quick. So there's a particular flow cost that you have. Uh, so there's a particular cost that is modeled of the monitoring of markets that looks like sort of like an entry cost. You pick a market and then you're there. Um, in some sense, this is more like a flow cost, right? In, in my intuition would be it's flow cost. When I'm a market maker in a limit order book, I have to expense, you know, I have to pay for co-location and all of that. So I'm wondering if, if this may not, maybe there is a way how you can actually just circumvent it and go straight to a, a full competition case. And then maybe you'll be able to make a, um, a comparison of the constant product market pricing against a, a you know 100 competition um, limit order book. Maybe there's a way to simplify it there, and so get a clean result for that. Um, it's also the 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 automated market maker reverse has a reversal of the trade um, that is built in, so it's sort of like the dynamic effect in there. But you don't do the same for the limit order book. It's probably worth mentioning it. Um, and then there's a, a lot of uh, work is done empirically on volatility of the price impact. Um, and there's a testable result that you produce, but it seems to be that that's basically actually by construction. So, um, but correct me if I'm wrong there. And then finally, and I think this is something which is also important to think about is at the moment, the way the model is written is there's a unit quantity that the liquidity trader trades, and that allows you to, to, to model how much liquidity you would provide. And that gives you basically the rise to the comparison result. There is a question from a theoretical perspective of whether this actually would extend if there would be a continuum of quantities that the other trader could trade. Could you, would you still be breaking even expectation in every case? Uh, so, um, this is, so this is an open question. It's not, it's not an easy question to answer, but I think it's worth at least thinking about or mentioning. 
So I know I'm already one minute over. Um, maybe I should just skip over the empirics because I really have rather little to say. Um, the only thing I would want to say there is I think the most important result here is, uh, is what uh, Christine and uh, um, Al Alfred refer to as the price impact, um, which you know essentially is the comparison the trading costs. And I think this is, if you want to bring the model to the data, this is the, the key component to focus on. Um, and uh, so that's it that I have to say. It's um, I like it. I like the paper a lot. It's the formal comparison between the concept product pricing, the limit order book, there's the endogenous provision of liquidity, this is great. It's really well, nicely done. Um, but and so if if I would do, I would focus a little more in terms of strengthening the the link. Um, in particular, there is one question which I had is: it seems that it's cheaper in Uniswap to trade for an un uninformed trader, which means that uh, you know an uninformed, an informed trader would learn less there. So there's a question of whether or not the price discovery would then occur mostly on Binance, so on the limit order book markets relative to the uh you know the uninformed if you want the uninformed market should be the swap exchanges right i'm over thank you and out <laughs>